Well, it's great to be here in Tucson, finally, down here preaching. And I hope to come down here uh, many more times this year. And uh, we're working on getting a better building. But just remember that Bible story where they were all hanging out the window and hanging out the doors. And they filled up the house. Remember they had to rip off the roof and lower the guy down in? So throughout the Bible, they didn't always have the best seating arrangement. Amen? So you guys are the diehards who are coming in the early days. So keep it up. Thank you for being a part of this church and for coming. But I want to focus on 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 5. The title of my sermon is, God's Wrath is Justified. God's Wrath is Justified. Look what the Bible says in verse 5. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. See, justified, the word justified means to be declared to be righteous. Okay, And so when I say God's wrath is justified, what I'm saying is that God is right to judge the wicked. God is right to be filled with wrath. God is right to be angry with the wicked every day. Everything that God does is right. And God's wrath or God's anger is justified. The Bible says, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So the Thessalonians have been persecuted. If you remember back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he talked about how they had suffered tribulation and persecution at the hands of their own countrymen. Their own fellow Greeks had persecuted them. Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and if you would actually just, just flip over there, it's so close, you might as well just look at it. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says in verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So he's saying, look, over in Judea, the Jews were persecuting the Christians, And the Thessalonians were getting persecuted by their fellow Greeks. They were actually getting persecuted by their fellow countrymen, the Bible says. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, It is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So when people persecute Christians, when people persecute us, when people persecute God's people, it's a righteous thing for God to trouble them. He will trouble those who trouble us. He will recompense tribulation unto those that trouble us. Notice how similar those words are, trouble and tribulation. Notice the T, the R, the B, the L, right? In fact, one of the early prophecies of the tribulation is back in Daniel chapter 12, and it says there shall be a time of trouble such as was not since the beginning of the world. And then Jesus, when he's preaching in Matthew 24, he calls it a time of tribulation. Daniel called it a great time of trouble. So those words are connected. So he's saying, look, people persecute you, people trouble you. It's a righteous thing for God to turn around and give them some trouble, amen? It says in verse number seven, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So the Bible's teaching here that at the second coming of Christ, He is going to punish the wicked in flaming fire. And it's going to be a day when those who believe, those who are saved, are going to be rejoicing and they're actually going to stand back in admiration. They're going to admire what Jesus Christ is doing. And we're going to see that in the book of Revelation tonight. We're going to flip over there. But it's going to be a terrible day for the unsaved when he punishes them in flaming fire. Now you say, flaming fire, isn't that a little bit redundant? I mean, is there any other kind of fire? Well, guess what? There are all kinds of people today who don't believe it's a literal fire. 
When we talk about the wrath of God, when we talk about the judgment of God, or when we talk about the punishment in hell, they want to say, oh, that fire there, it's just figurative. So that's why God calls it flaming fire. Okay, just to let you know, it's the kind with flames. All right? Now flip over, if you would, to Revelation. Because the Bible told us in 2 Thessalonians that when Christ Jesus is revealed from heaven with his angels to uh, punish the wicked in flaming fire, that he is going to be glorified in his saints at that time, and he's going to be admired in all them that believe at that time. So those that believe are going to be excited, they're going to be rejoicing, the wrath are going to be, or I'm sorry, the wicked are going to be punished by God's wrath. Now look at Revelation chapter 19. What's the title of the sermon? God's wrath is justified. It's a righteous thing for God to pour out his wrath. He is right to do that. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Now, Alleluia is just basically a Greek version of the Hebrew Hallelujah, right? Most of the songs in the hymnal spell it out as Hallelujah, right? With an H at the beginning, right? Hallelujah, right? Well, Hallelujah is just saying in Hebrew, praise the Lord. That's all that means. Hallelujah just means praise the Lord. So that's what they're saying here. They're saying, praise the Lord, right? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Watch this. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. And has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. You say, well, that's not very Christian of them. <laughs> Getting all excited about Babylon being destroyed. Getting all excited about the great whore being judged. Being all excited about the wrath and judgment of God. But wait a minute. These people are in heaven. Isn't that what it says in verse 1? He said, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Let me ask this. Is there any sin in heaven amongst God's people? I mean, do God's people, when they, when they die and go to heaven, do they continue to sin up there? No, there's no sin going on in heaven because of the fact that the only reason that we sin is because we're still in our sinful flesh. When we go to heaven, we will have shed our sinful flesh. And we know at the second coming of Christ, we'll be changed to be like unto Christ. He'll change our, our, our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So if these people are in heaven, they are not wrong to have this attitude. They must have the right attitude, right? Because if they're in heaven, they're glorified. They have the right attitude. And they're saying, true and righteous are God's judgments. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Why? Because he judged the great whore. Why? Hey, he destroyed Babylon. Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Is that a wrong attitude? Apparently not, since it's coming from heaven. Go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse number 9 says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Again, we have the souls of people in heaven, the souls of just men made perfect, and they are saying, Lord, how long are you not going to judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Boy, these people are looking forward to the wrath of God. They're celebrating God's wrath. Why is that? Because God's wrath is justified. God is righteous to pour out his wrath. What he does is right. Everything he does is right. Amen. Amen. Go to chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9. Now, why is God justified in pouring out his wrath on this earth? Well, we see God's wrath begin to be poured out in chapters 8 and 9 of Revelation. 
right? At the end of chapter 6, it said that the great day of his wrath is come. Then we have that interlude in chapter 7. And then in chapter 8 and 9, we have the seal, or I'm sorry, the trumpets of God's wrath. Uh, chapter 8 has the first four trumpets. And then in chapter 9, we have trumpets 5 and 6. And these trumpet judgments are very serious judgments upon the earth where God rains fire and brimstone out of heaven, burns up all the grass, burns up one-third of the trees. He ends up turning the ocean into blood and poisoning the water, and men are scorched with heat. And you have these locusts from hell in chapter 9 with the fifth trumpet. And then you have this uh, these horsemen with the tails like scorpions. and I mean, just all these horrible things, right? And after six trumpets of just God slamming this earth with his wrath, and, and, and this is a long period of time. I mean, one trumpet alone lasted for five months in the case of the, the locust from hell. Look what it says in verse 20. It says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues. So, I mean, they've survived the fire and brimstone. They've survived the ocean and the water being poisoned. They survived the scorching heat. They survived the locusts. They survived the armies. It says the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. You say, look, they still did not change. They still did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. After all that, they're still worshiping idols. They still have their little statue. They still have Buddha. They still have their Hindu gods. They still got their little plastic Jesus or whatever uh, fake idol that they're worshiping. They did not repent of their idolatry. Verse 21, neither repented they of their murders. I mean, they're still committing murder. They're, they're probably still having an abortion or murdering people. They're not repenting of their sorceries. They're still into witchcraft. They're still into voodoo. They're still doing all this demonic stuff. They didn't repent of their fornication. They're still sleeping together out of wedlock during this time. And they did not repent of their thefts, their stealing, their looting. Look, God pours out his wrath on man. He pours out his judgment in an unprecedented way. And what do they do? They just keep on sinning. Just keep on fornicating. Keep on murdering, stealing, continuing idolatry. God's wrath is justified. Can you see why God is so mad? I mean, they just keep on being a sorcerer and a murderer and a thief and everything else. Look at chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 16. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God upon their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there were seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. You know, if you read the book of Revelation, there's a certain feeling that you get from it in chapter 1, chapter 4, chapter 5. And I'll tell you what that feeling is that you get from the mood of the book of Revelation is one of triumph. Even though it's such a negative book, even though there are a lot of people being killed, even though... Uh, the earth's being destroyed by plagues and so forth, you get a really triumphant feel and a triumphant mood from the book of Revelation. From chapter 1, you get that. Chapter 4, I mean, in chapter 5, everybody's rejoicing. The Lamb has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And there's great excitement and rejoicing and praising God. And in fact, Revelation probably has more praises to God of any New Testament book. 
I mean, almost every chapter is mentioning the power and strength and glory and honor and might unto the Lord our God. You know, to give him thanksgiving and, and wealth and everything. You know, everything goes to the Lord. All glory. Everything was made for him and for his glory. I mean, just over and over again, they're just praising God, praising God, praising God. And a lot of people are pretty happy in the book of Revelation. There's a lot of rejoicing and shouting and singing praises to God in the midst of all the carnage, in the midst of all the destruction. It's hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. We give thee thanks. Your wrath is come. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I mean, that's the way the whole book is. 22 chapters of just victory and triumph, right? God's wrath is justified. We don't need to be ashamed of God's wrath or shy away from talking about God's wrath or say, you know, well, it's too bad. God has to pour out his wrath, you know, and, and uh, it's just really such a shame. Yeah, it is such a shame that people reject a free gift when it's offered to them of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a shame that people just live their whole lives in wickedness and sinning, and they just don't repent of their fornication, they don't repent of their theft, they don't repent of their murder, they don't repent of their sorcery, they don't repent of their idolatry, and God ends up having to judge nations. God ends up having to destroy cities and burn them to the ground. I mean, look, just recently, there's been a lot of talk in the news about how New York has made these horrific styles of abortion legal. And of course, all of abortion is murder, but even these horrific uh, late-term abortions, the partial birth abortion, the, the nine-month pregnant abortion. Right. Don't get mad at God when he destroys New York. Don't get mad at God when he pours out his wrath. Don't get mad at God when he punishes that obscene wickedness that just for year after year after year in America, we're being de-Christianized. Year after year, we spit in the face of God as a nation. Year after year, the murder, the sodomy, the fornication, the wickedness. You know what? One day, God is going to judge. And you know what I'm going to say? Hallelujah! Amen. For the Lord God, our omnipotent, reigneth. He judged the great whore. Amen. 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 Her smoke Amen. rose up forever and ever. You say, well, that's not very Christian. It's very. It's actually very Christian because this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> the Christ in Christian. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Okay? So the Bible teaches this. Look at Revelation 16, verse 5. This is in the midst of God pouring out his wrath in the seven vials. So we have the seven trumpets over in chapters 8, 9, and 11. And then in chapter 16, we have the vial judgments, right? So there's a vial here that's poured out in verse 4 upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood. Now look at verse 5. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord. Look, folks, what does justified mean? It means to be declared righteous. Isn't it interesting that when God is judging and pouring out his wrath, he keeps being declared righteous over and over again? Over and over again, somebody's there to declare him righteous. The apostle Paul was doing it in 2 Thessalonians. saying, hey, it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. It's the righteous judgment of God when he comes in flaming fire to take vengeance upon them that know God, not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here, in the midst of God pouring out his wrath, somebody's there to say, Thou art righteous, O Lord. You are right. What you're doing is right. Amen. Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Man, you are right to give them blood to drink. Hey, they shed the blood of the saints and prophets. They deserve to drink blood. Hey, they've been wicked. They've troubled God's people. They've persecuted God's people. They've spat in the face of God. Give them, O Lord. What wilt thou give them? The Bible said in the Old Testament. A miscarrying womb and dry breasts. That's what it said in the book of Jeremiah, I believe. So over and over again, God's judgment 
is declared to be right. It's declared to be righteous, okay? Now flip over, if you would, to chapter number... Well, actually, let's go back to Colossians chapter 3. Let's go to the epistle of Paul to the Colossians, chapter number 3. So Revelation is just chock full of this idea of God judging, God pouring out his wrath, and being declared righteous for doing so. He's, he's told to be doing the right thing, okay? So there's nothing to shy away from preaching the wrath of God. And you know, it needs to be preached in pulpits all over America that God's wrath is justified today. And look, I'm all for preaching on the love of God, and it's the love of God that even allows us to be saved. I mean, we'd all be doomed without the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. But let's not forget about the wrath of God. Right. And God's going to judge our nation and he's going to be right when he does it. And we ought to rejoice when he does it. Why rejoice? Because in everything give thanks. Amen. In Amen. everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And you know, everything God does is right at the end of the day. Now it's hard for us to understand that. You know, we're human and we're living in this world and we're attached to the things of this world. Because we're here in this flesh and, and we, we go through life and we get attached to all the things of this world. You know, the, the places and the people and the things and so forth. But you know, one day, one day we're going to leave this world and we're going to go to be in heaven and it's all going to be burned up. Everything that's here. You know, that's why the Bible says set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So it's easy for us because our affection is often on the things of earth and we often are uh, um, attached to the things of this world, and, and we have the mentality of this world sometimes, we look at the wrath of God or the judgment of God as a really negative thing. Like, like kind of like, well, we, we love Jesus, we love the cross, we love the resurrection, we love the, the birth of Christ, we love the miracles, but it's it, we, we kind of like, oh, why does he have to be so mean, or why does he have to... Uh, wipe out whole cities and why does he have to send people to hell for all eternity but you know what that's just because we're human because one day when we get to heaven and we understand everything and we're no longer having a, 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 a wrong attitude or the sinful flesh we're just gonna we're just gonna literally just have the popcorn out and just be like this is great <laughs> as we watch the plagues poured out we're gonna be loving it now, that might sound morbid to you, but hold on a second. God, everything God does is right. Okay. And so I do believe that we will be up there rejoicing. And you know what? We're just going to be so excited to be in heaven. And we're going to be so blown away by the holiness of God and, and being in the actual physical presence of God himself. And beholding our Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face, that we're not going to be sitting there Say, oh, do you have to destroy America? Why? You know, we're just going to be like, you are so right. You are so justified. You gave them every chance. I mean, you sent prophet after prophet after prophet rising up early and sending them, right? As they said in the Old Testament. Boy, how many times did God send prophets to Israel and prophets to Judah rising up early and sending them? And what did they do? They mocked them. They beat them. They harassed them. They treated them bad, and finally God says, that's it, I'm pouring out my wrath. And all God's people said, hallelujah, amen. amen. Praise the Lord, okay? And it's, gonna, it's the same way in America. I, I think, in fact, America probably has more prophets than Israel ever had. Right, right. America's had more prophets than Judah ever had. I mean, in America, the gospel is preached in so many places, in so many ways. I mean, there are so many churches, so many preachers, right. so many Bible verses, so many chances of people getting their door knocked or, or somehow getting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what do they do? They scoff at it. They mock it. They're too caught up in the things of this world. Right. Well, someday it's going to catch up with them, folks. Amen. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Why is God justified in pouring out his wrath? The Bible says in verse number 5, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then it says this, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children 
of disobedience. So you want to know why God's wrath is on the children of disobedience? You want to know why God is turning water into blood, raining fire from the sky in Revelation, uh, destroying entire cities and leveling them to the ground? Well, it's because of fornication. It's because of uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. What is evil concupiscence? Well, think about Cupid. What is Cupid associated with? Like Valentine's Day, falling in love, the little fat little naked angel <laughs> shooting little heart arrows at people to make them fall in love, right, Cupid? Well, this comes from the same root word as that person Cupid, concupiscence, okay? So when we talk about fornication, when we talk about uncleanness, and when we talk about inordinate affection, lasciviousness, concupiscence, these are really just a lot of different ways to kind of describe the same thing or the same category of things. What we're basically talking about is all different types of fornication and adultery, prostitution. You know, we're talking about sins of that nature, sins of that kind. That all falls under lasciviousness, concupiscence. Concupiscence is desiring those wrong things, okay? And the Bible says that that stuff makes God mad. And then in addition to that, of course, is the covetousness, which is idolatry, where people are serving mammon instead of God. They're serving money instead of God. They're covetous of all the goods and the material wealth, and that's who they serve. And the Bible says that's idolatry. When you're going to just put making money as the purpose of your life and acquiring goods and, 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 and possessions as your aim in life, he's saying, you're an idolater. You know, that's your God. Amen. You can't serve God and mammon. You have to choose which one you're going to serve. And so the Bible says because of these things, God's wrath comes on the children of disobedience. Boy, I'll make you think twice about committing fornication or any of these other sins of the bedroom that are listed here. Uh, and folks, if you love money, you say, well, I'm a pretty good guy. I mean, I'm a nice person. I don't do anything to hurt anybody. But let's say your whole life is just wrapped up in just making money. That's all you care about. No time for church. No time for soul winning. You're not reading the Bible. You're just all into getting wealthy, making money, eating, drinking, and being married. Well, guess what? That makes God mad too. God doesn't want to be ignored. God didn't create you so you could just please yourself, serve yourself, do everything for yourself. He created you for his pleasure. He created you to serve him. And if you're going to ignore him, or even worse yet, bow down to some statue, some little Buddha, or, or whatever the false god of Hinduism, or whatever the idol, and praying to some saint so-and-so, some fake, made-up, long-haired hippie that you pray to, or whatever, praying to Mary, or, or whatever else you make an idol of, or a false god, or goddess out of. You know what? God is angry with the wicked every day and God's wrath comes upon the children of disobedience because of these things so he's saying look mortify those things put those things to death and he says in the which verse 7 you also walked sometime when you lived in them but now you also put off all these anger wrath malice blasphemy filthy communication out of your mouth lie not one to another seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Go if you would to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. God's wrath is justified. God's wrath is justified. Look, folks, the reason why we need a sermon like this is because God's wrath is probably going to come on America in our lifetime. Even if we're not living in the very last days, even if the Great Tribulation doesn't happen in our lifetime, even if the Second Coming of Christ doesn't happen in our lifetime, bad stuff's going to happen to America in our lifetime. 
there's going to be some kind of a natural disaster or there's going to be some kind of a, a horrible recession or economic depression. There's going to be some kind of an invasion or attack. You say, well, how do you know that? Because God's not mocked. And whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And we are being de-Christianized so fast in this country, we are going to reap the whirlwind. Okay, Whether it's the book of Revelation or not, we are going to reap something in our lifetime. I guarantee it. And when those bad things happen, what's your attitude going to be? Because you know what some people's attitude is when bad things happen? <coughs> is to just get all sad and depressed and <coughs> maybe even get upset at God. <coughs> oh, this isn't fair, God. Why are you doing this? And, you know, maybe even charge God foolishly and blame God or something like that. But you know what? Whatever happens to Arizona, we deserve it. Whatever happens to California, we deserve it. Whatever happens in the United States, we deserve it, folks. We just sent, in this state of Arizona, I just found this out like less than two weeks ago, that we elected a sodomite to the United States Senate. Who knew that? Nobody cares about politics. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Nobody knew, one person knew. Yeah, everybody's like, I don't know. Folks, we have sent a full-blown sodomite to the United States Senate to represent us. And you know, senators, they're in there for how long? Six years. So for the next six years, an open lesbian is going to be representing the state of Arizona in the United States Senate. And folks, Arizona is not the most liberal state. I mean, you think like Arizona is a little bit more normal or conservative. Think again. I mean, we just sent an open sodomite to represent our state in the United States Senate. So look, let's say God brought judgment upon the state of Arizona in whatever the format. You know, let's say he sent some kind of a drought or let's say he sent some kind of an epidemic or he sent some kind of a, uh, an economic downturn. Would you really blame him? I mean, could you really say, well, God, how could you? We're nice people and we live here. You know, you'd have to sit there and say, well, I don't blame him because, I mean, when people are just going to spit in his face and just send open sodomites to the Capitol to represent our state, then obviously that's disgusting in the eyes of God. That's an abomination in the eyes of God. And you know what? At that point, all we can do is just pray for God to protect us right. and pray for God to protect his church and pray for God to protect his people. But we cannot even for one second lament the fact that God is sending his judgment. Now, one of the good things when God sends his wrath and judgment is that often it, it's a wake-up call that will call people to repentance. You know, uh, if he did send some kind of a judgment to Arizona or California or the United States in general, usually it will cause people to get right with God. Now, some people are never going to get right with God like those Revelation 9 people who just wouldn't repent no matter what happened. But think about when 9-11 happened. I mean, people for a couple days there sought after God. I remember I went to church on Sunday right after 9-11 happened, and the place was packed. I mean, you could not even get a seat. It was packed. Now, why is that? Why, why did September 11th boost church attendance? And I think churches all over America were packed. Okay. Why? Because people were scared. People were afraid. I mean, people didn't know what's coming next. So they're like, man, I need to go to church. <laughs> they, they started seeking God. They, you know, it's like the saying goes, there are no atheists in foxholes. You know, when people are at their wits end and when people are scared or, or going through punishments or judgments, man, they seek the Lord. And so sometimes God has to send that stuff to wake people up. You know, when the economy's good, the soul winning isn't as good. When the economy tanks, the soul winning gets better. Yeah, right, amen. In fact, we used to have this area that we would go soul winning in Phoenix, and, and I called it Samaria. Okay. And the reason that I called it Samaria was that they had built all these really fancy, nice subdivisions of really fancy houses. But then the economy crashed back around uh, 2006, 2007, when the economy went really bad. And the housing prices just crashed. I bought my house at the worst possible time. Okay. I don't have any regrets, though, because I bought the house in order to start a church in it. 
And so I started Faith Forward Baptist Church in the house that I bought. And it was important to me to live in the city because I, I didn't want to start it out in suburbia. I wanted to start the church in the city. And so I bought the house and I paid $225,000 for my house. Okay. And this is an old, beat up, 1,290 square foot house from the 50s, galvanized plumbing, single pane windows, uh, just, you know, a lot of things falling apart about it. But it was a good deal, believe it or not, because they were asking 240000 And everything that was 250000 225000 was was much lesser of a house, okay? Wow. So we were excited to pay $225,000 for this 1,290 square foot beat up house from the 50s. Uh, but it was, it was a good neighborhood. It was right on the corner. We were, we were happy. It was in the city. Great, right? We bought that house. And after we bought it, it went up to, two, it, the, 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 the appraisal was two twenty five, And then we watched on Zillow go up to two forty thousand. And then we watched it drop. And the value of our house dropped to where, at, at the low point, it was worth $69,000. So can you imagine paying $225,000 for a house, and then it was worth like $70,000 at the bottom of the market. So that was a major crash. And then it took years and years, and now our house is finally back to being worth what we paid for it. But for years, we were upside down on our house for many, many years. Uh, it was just, it was, it was worth 70,000, 80,000, 90,000, 100,000. But who cares? I mean, if you're gonna live in it, right? It's just a number, just ignore it, you know? Just keep paying your monthly payment and just forget about it. You know, you know it doesn't, it's no use crying over spilled milk, right? But guess what? There were all these fancy neighborhoods and they were built like right before that housing crash where things went from being 225 to 70,000, right? So these subdivisions ended up just being like abandoned, like like they couldn't sell the houses, they could hardly even give the houses away for what it cost to build them. So there's all these fancy neighborhoods, but a whole bunch of poor people moved into these houses because all of a sudden they got really cheap. <laughs> so actually you'd walk in these neighborhoods and there's all these fancy houses but everybody who lived in them were basically just poor people or working class people, just average people. So, it, you know, usually when you go to a fancy neighborhood, the soul winning's not that good, right? Because it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. But we would go to these nice areas and they were filled with receptive people because it was a lower class of people that were not as prideful and arrogant as the rich often are or the well-off are. And so we ended up doing a ton of great soul winning. And we called it Samaria because it was like where they took all the rich people into captivity and then they brought like the poor of the land and the poor of the, of the land kind of took over the houses and took over the farms and took over everything. So we called it Samaria because of that. And we would go soul winning over there and have a great time. And I was thinking about it, you know, a lot of these wealthy areas, a lot of these areas that are unreceptive to the gospel, you know what, I wonder if God might just have to bring an economic recession in order to basically humble these people. If their stocks would crash and if their investments would crash, then maybe that could humble them. And then maybe they could actually listen to the gospel and go to heaven. Because you know what? Getting saved and going to heaven is way more important than your portfolio. It's way more important than whatever wealth you have in this life that's just like a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. You know, my grandpa was very successful in business back in the 1950s and the uh, early 60s. He was in a booming economy there in Los Angeles, California, right after World War II in LA. It was like a land of opportunity. So all throughout the 50s, he was making just huge amounts of money, insane amounts of money, just filthy rich, but he was not saved. And my grandma prayed and said, Lord, if it will mean him getting saved, let us lose everything, Lord. You know, I'm willing to lose the standard of living. I'm willing to lose the money. And you know what? He ended up losing all that money, losing his business, having problems financially, and losing it, and just being humbled financially. And then he ended up getting saved. And you know what? If that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be here, right? Because that's how my grandpa and my dad got saved, was because he had to be brought down a notch, folks. So look, if America is brought down a notch, our attitude should be, Hallelujah. Right, Praise God.
Praise the Lord. And you know what? If it affects us a little bit, well, you know what? We're willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. We're willing to go through hard times and hardships if it means people getting saved, right? And so thank God we're not going to be here for all that crazy stuff in Revelation with the water into blood and the fire and brimstone coming out of the sky. We're not going to be here for that stuff. But you know what? Even throughout our lives, there are going to be other smaller judgments that God brings. There are going to be other judgments that come upon America or upon Arizona Folks, it has to happen when we spit in the face of God as a nation. It will happen. Right. God's not mocked. Amen. What's our attitude toward that? Is it to whine about it, complain about it, be down about it? And then when a preacher gets up and says, this is the judgment of God. You know what a bunch of whining Christians will do? Oh, that's so insensitive. <laughs> Isn't that what they'll do? Yeah. Bad things will happen and a preacher will get up and say, you're being judged by God. This is God's wrath. And everybody flips out. And even, even saved Christians will start whining about it because they didn't hear preaching like this. That's why this sermon is important. Right, so that we know how to react when bad things happen because of the fact that when 9-11 happened, there were preachers who came out right away when 9-11 happened. And you know what they said? This is the wrath of God. When 9-11 happened, they said, this is a judgment from God. This is God warning us. He's trying to warn us about the abortion and the sodomy. And you know what? When they did that, people got really mad at those preachers. I believe it was uh, Jerry Falwell, you know, who's, who was kind of a famous preacher that would be on TV a lot and stuff like that. And he is a compromiser. But he got up... And, and said as a judgment of God, and then like a few days later, he apologized and, and said, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean that. And I was watching it, it on TV with my dad at the time, and it was like, I think it was Geraldo Rivera or something, was interviewing him. Forgive me if I get the details wrong, but I, I believe it was Geraldo Rivera is interviewing him, and he's just like, what were you thinking, you idiot? And he's just like, I know, I'm stupid, I'm an idiot. You know, it's just like... You know, why? Because that kind of preaching is not popular. Look, men of God, they should be ready when the judgment of God happens to justify God. Amen. To justify God. The Bible said, you're in Romans 1, but just over in Romans 3, it says in Romans 3, verse 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, watch this, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Boy, God is justified in his sayings and in his judgment. God is declared to be righteous. And when God punishes the wicked and judges the wicked, we ought to immediately declare him righteous and say, you know what? God's right. We deserve this. Repent. Get right with God. Straighten up, America. Wake up, America. That's what we ought to be preaching. Look, that's what every preacher ought to have preached after 9-11 or any time other bad things happen. They should be getting up and preaching hard preaching that, that calls people to repentance, that calls people to get right and get the sin out of our lives so that God will spare us. Look, what did Jonah preach? Jonah went in and he preached yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And what, what was the result of that hard preaching? And he didn't, we know he had a bad attitude. He didn't have a good attitude at all. Okay, he wanted it to happen. He preached and he said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And what was the result of that hard preaching, that spirit-filled preaching from a man of God, Jonah? You know what? They, they turned from their evil way. They repented. And you know what? They said... We need to put on sackcloth. We need to fast. We need to pray. We need to beg God for mercy. And they said, you know what? Not only are we going to put on sackcloth, we're going to put sackcloth on the dog. We're going to put sackcloth on our animals. We're going to put our pets in sackcloth. I mean, these people, they're just, they were so freaked out at the judgment of God. They're just trying to cover all the bases. And then I think God, I think God's kidding at the end. I think God's joking at the end when he talks about all the people in the city and much cattle, you know, because the, even the cattle was repenting. Even the cattle was in sackcloth, okay? That's the funny part of the story. But look, here's what I love about that story. Is that 
Jonah didn't even preach. Forty days, Nineveh's going to be overthrown unless you get right with God. Is that what he said? There's no mention of Jonah giving any pathway for these people to get it right. He just got up and just preached wrath. He just got up and just preached judgment and punishment. And yet, what did the people do? They responded to it. And they figured, you know what? Who can tell if God will be merciful? Maybe God will be merciful. Maybe if we just fast. And, and you know what? God is merciful. And God spared them. So look, I'm not saying that Jonah is our role model. Okay? Because obviously Jonah had some problems. But you know what? I'd rather be Jonah than a bunch of liberal, watered-down preachers who aren't accomplishing anything. Right. You know, I like Jonah because at least Jonah got something done. At least he got a bunch of people saved. And even if he had a bad attitude, at least he preached the Word of God boldly. And, and even though God kind of had to put a gun to his head to get him to do it, at least he did it, and he did a good job, and he got something done. Folks, God's wrath is justified. We need to preach the wrath of God. We need to preach on hell. We need to preach on the book of Revelation. We need to preach on the trumpets and the vials and, and preach about God's anger and wrath because it calls people to repentance. Now, some people are reached by the love of God and some people are reached by the wrath of God. The Ninevites, they responded to the wrath of God. Who knows if they would have repented if he would have got, come in preaching a loving sermon. And maybe God even picked... The angriest, most bad attitude preacher that he could find, who had such a bad attitude, he didn't even want to go there. And then after they repent, he's like, I want you to judge him anyway, and sets up a little booth so that he can watch God destroy the city, just hoping it gets destroyed, even after they got right. Look, maybe God sent such an angry, bad attitude preacher because he knew that's what they needed to hear. Right, amen. Right. Was the hard preaching. Why? Because the Bible says, of some have compassion making a difference, and others saved with fear, right. pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. You know, some people are going to get saved, not because of preaching on God's wrath. Some people will get saved because of just the beauty of the story of the birth of Christ. Some people are going to get saved because the, the story of Jesus Christ coming to this earth and dying on the cross for us and rising again is the greatest story ever told. And some people are just going to be moved by his compassion. They're going to be moved by his love. They're going to be moved by his mercy. They're going to be moved by the beauty of that gospel story. But you know, other people are going to be reached by some hellfire and damnation preaching that just scares the hell out of them. Right? And they're going to be like, I need to get saved. I mean, look, there have been preachers throughout the generations that have gotten up and screamed and yelled and hollered and preached hellfire and damnation and people trembled and feared and got saved as a result. And then there have been other preachers who preached loving, compassionate, merciful sermons and people responded to that. Okay, There's more than one way to reach people with the gospel. There's more than one way to reach people with the word of God. So there's... Having compassion of some, making a difference, and others saved with fear. Both are needed, amen? amen? They both have their place. They're both legitimate, folks. That's why we need to preach the whole Bible. Okay? Some preachers are meaner than others. Some preachers are softer than others. But you know what? God uses all preachers of the gospel who are actually preaching the right gospel. He's going to use them all to reach different kinds of people. Okay? But we all need to preach the entire Bible and not shy away from God's wrath or shy away from the judgments of God. Let's not shy away from the book of Leviticus or shy away from Romans 1 or shy away from the book of Revelation. Folks, that stuff is right. Revelation is just as right as John 3.16. Leviticus is just as right as John 3.16. It's all God's word. So let's close in Romans 1 here. It says in verse 18, for the wrath of God, what's the title of the sermon? God's wrath is justified. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, 
being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Hey, is God justified in pouring out his wrath on them? Yes, they are without excuse. Oh, it's not fair. It's fair. It's right. God is just. Why? Well, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And you know what? The United States of America today has become like one great big fat church of Laodicea is what we've become like in America today. You say, why do you say that? Because he told the church at Laodicea, he said that you know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He said, thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Boy, that's America today. Yeah. Oh man, we're rich, we're increased with goods. You know what? That's what we hear when we knock on the door of prosperous people. I'm good, thanks. We don't need anything here. We're good. We're, we're, we're good. We have need of nothing. We're okay. We're good. I'm good, thanks. No, we're good. We're good here. We're all good here. How many times have you heard that? No, we're already good. We're good. We're good here. But they don't know that they're wretched. Right, man. Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What? Oh, because behind that fancy house and fancy car, they're poor because that stuff's all going to burn up. Right, amen. They don't have any treasure in heaven. They're not even going to heaven, right? If they don't believe in Jesus, amen. they need to be saved, folks. Amen. God's wrath is justified. He's right in everything he does. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Whatever God does is right. His amen. wrath is justified. And look, when God's wrath comes whether in a small way or in a large way, we need to have a good attitude about it. We need to have a good attitude and look on the bright side and say, hey, you know what? America's suffering right now? Good. Amen. You know, like a grumpy cat meme, right? <laughs> oh, America's being judged by it now? Good. Oh, the great whore is judged? Good. Oh, Babylon has fallen? Good. Amen. Oh, they're drinking blood over there? Good! Fire and brimstone raining from the sky? Good! The grumpy cat face, right? You picture it? It is good. Everything God does is good. Everything he does is right. And you know what? Oh, the economy's crashing? Good. Why? Better soul winning. Hey, God can feed us. God can prosper us. God can take care of us. We can live in the land of Goshen while Egypt is suffering, folks. But... Whatever happens, let's have a right attitude. And you know when a preacher gets up and condemns our country or gets up and condemns our city or our state and a preacher gets up and says, this is the wrath of God on America when a 9-11 type event happens, you know what we ought to say? Amen. Amen. Right. Not, oh, how could you? You're so insensitive. What about the victims? What about their families? Blah, blah, blah. What about God? Yeah. What about God? What about his feelings? He's angry. He's mad. He's right. He's justified in his wrath. Let's fire his word of prayer.